can do is use the knowledge and experience that we've gained from looking in the past to say the kind of thing we'd expect to find that far ahead in the future. You can be pretty sure that in two million centuries there will have been several mass extinctions comparable to the one that polished off the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Um, that one was caused by a comet or meteorite hitting the Earth. There will probably be some more major strikes of Earth, catastrophic strikes of Earth, during the next two million centuries. So whatever the pageant of life it was showing at any one time is going to be destroyed and destroyed again and destroyed again several times during that period. Will there be any predictable recurrences in each of those successive destructions? Probably yes, because we can look back at the destruction of the dinosaurs, at, at the destruction of the, the Permian e extinction. We've got other ones we can look at. And we see again and again what happens is that the, the fauna of the Earth is more or less totally wiped out. And then what takes its place is different in detail, but you get the same pattern coming out. So um, when the dinosaurs went extinct, uh, the mammals, they took about five million years to build up to strength. The mammals, which had before that been little shrew-like creatures, took over and stepped into the dinosaur's shoes in a sense. And so you've got the same range of types. You've got great big lumbering herbivores, rhinoceroses and giant rhinoceroses and elephants, which took the place of the massive brontosaurs, diplodocus and so on. You've got uh, tigers and lions and saber-tooths, which took the place of the great um, dinosaur carnivores, the allosaurs and, and the tyrannosaurs. You had little mouse-like dinosaurs, and they were replaced by mammal m mice. Um, flying, um, not actually dinosaurs, but pterodactyls, which were, which were similar to dinosaurs. Uh, and, and birds and, and bats replaced them. So in two, un, two mm. um, million centuries' time, we can expect to see a similar range of types. But maybe they'll be all descended from, um, I don't know, frogs or rats or, or, or something, which will have branched out and flowered into a whole range of new uh, types, large and small, carnivores, herbivores, flying, digging, jumping, um, swimming. And, and can you predict, I mean, it, it is really difficult to comprehend, thinking back over that stretch of time, but even harder to comprehend how you predict over centuries, millions of centuries forward. Is it, is it clear to you that the changes that we will see will be will in some ways be shaped by, by human society, or is human society rather irrelevant in that sweep of time? Well, it is true that, that our species is, I mean, all species are unique, but humans are very, very unique. Um, and so it is possible that uh, we will have a very, very long-lasting impact on the Earth. Um, it's been argued plausibly enough that there is a mass extinction going on now, which is, mm. which is created by by humans. Um, I suppose a part of the answer to your question would have to be, will we, will we have gone extinct? And mm. Will our descendants have gone extinct? Um, on past form, the answer is probably yes, because the great majority of species that ever, ever lived have gone extinct. On the other hand, um, we are so unique that it's possible that, that we, our technology might enable us not to go extinct. Mm. And, um, E e even a major catastrophe like the one that killed the dinosaurs, um, he humans just might be able to go into underground bunkers and store food and store seed banks and, and all the sort of science fiction scenario mm. to, to, to survive a major catastrophe of that sort and then re-emerge from underground and repopulate the world. So it, it's a perfectly plausible science fiction scenario that the, the descendants of humans might indeed be still technologically advanced in, in, in hundreds of millions of years' time. Hmm. Can you talk about one other... We, we talked a little bit about time and this, this phrase of Darwin's, the hand of time. The other idea, of course, that we all struggle with when we come into terms with evolution is this idea that, uh, which you touched upon obviously in The Blind Watchmaker, this idea that there is no single authority that is 
that is organising this, and yet at the same time it's not left to chance, that natural selection yeah. has a process to it, but not a clear, I would say, order. There are many people who think that there's, there are only two ways in which you can get highly organised, complicated things like living creatures. One is design, and the other is chance. Mm. And, of course, if you think that, then it's no wonder you're sceptical about evolution, because if it really were chance, yeah. it couldn't possibly give rise to uh, the um, wonderful panoply of complexity that we see. So it isn't chance, and it isn't design. It's natural selection. Natural selection is an anti-chance process. It's a non-random process. And so this is another of the difficult things to grasp, and the hand of time is one of them. The absence of a controller, the absence of a, of a top-down governor, a designer, a creator, is very hard mm. to grasp, because we're so used to the idea that complicated things that look as though they've been designed um, must have been designed. Well, mm. they mustn't have been designed. They don't have to be designed. Natural selection will do the job as well. And that is a very hard concept for some people to grasp. Mm. And, it, and it's, it is particularly difficult because what you're saying here is that the opposite of a plan is not no plan, is not, is That's not right, chaos. That's right, yes. There, 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 there never was a plan mm. in, in evolution. And we, we see this in that, in that um, so many species go extinct and, they, and they are, they're driven extinct. Mm. And so, I mean, a, a, a good planner mm. wouldn't, uh, wouldn't let that, ha that happen. So there, there never was a plan. And yet with hindsight, if you look at any one species, it, 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 it looks beautifully designed to mm. swim like a mm. dolphin or fly like a swift mm. or dig like a mole or an aardvark. Um, so there is a very, very powerful illusion of planning, mm. powerful illusion of design. And it's a really staggering and exciting fact that a, a blind physical process, natural selection, is capable of producing this extraordinary simulacrum mm. of design. Mm. But then at the same time, I guess one of the things that I was really sort of impressed by the book that it does is it also explains why some animals are not very good at what they do. That if we talk a little bit for, about rats' teeth, for example, you, you explain to a certain extent why for well, a rat to get really good teeth would probably be for a rat to pay too high a price. Well, that's right. I mean, the, the passage about, about rats' teeth is actually something that, that w would apply to man-made mm. machines as well. I think the, the point there is that it's possible for either a machine or an animal or indeed a tooth to be too good for its job. Any engineer will tell you, um, don't tell me to build a perfect bridge. Mm. Tell me how much money I've got to spend on this bridge mm. and I will build you the best bridge that can be built for this budget. Mm. That's a very a great oversimplification. Mm. Animals 